आई वी एम Welcome to episode three of Getting Meta. The first two episodes were with two personalities, if I may use the word, Amit Verma and Rohan Joshi. And this show is going to be slightly different. While no less of a fount of insight and indeed fun to be around, my guest today doesn't necessarily put him out there too much. So an introduction is in order. Mohan Krishna Murthy, Doctor Mohan Krishna Murthy, is one of my oldest friends. and i mean that in both senses of the word he has many facets he's a accomplished academic he is currently the pro vice chancellor at the university of queensland in australia and before that he had roles at melbourne's monash university and he was the ceo of a collaboration between that university and iit bombay during which time he stayed in mumbai and i got to know him at a personal level then He has worked with several universities and government bodies and got his PhD in 1990 from Imperial College in London and his research focused on the development of advanced mathematical optimization models and algorithms that turn data into information that can be used to make better decisions. Phew. Now, that intro might make you think that I've got a serious professor on this show, so let me turn the tack a little bit over here. Mohan is one of the most fun and funny guys I I know he has an insane wicked sense of humor is an amazing host he loves board games and he has this joy the weaver around him that is magnetic and makes you want to adopt whatever he did in life to reach that level of happiness by the time you are 50 or 55 or whatever age mohan really is he refuses to tell us uh, he is an active trekker he's done several himalayan treks and indeed i joined him for one of these myself and it was an incredible experience. experience he's completed several marathons and he's inspired many people half his age to take up uh, running and he's recently developed a love for cycling as well apart from this <laughs> yes there's more he's an aficionado of board games indian classical music wine and probably several other things that i don't know about he is a true patron of the arts starting a charity for indian arts in australia and he's managed a concert featuring one of india's biggest musical exports and by now you'll have a sense of why i asked mohan to be on the show is not just all about the above but about the decisions that he took to get to where he is his ways of thinking and more this was one of the best conversations i've had while recording getting meta and i sincerely hope you like it it's a long episode it's close to 1 hour 45 minutes but trust me it's worth it it's packed with anecdotes insights personal experience and of course a lot of uh, jokes as well i hope you enjoyed and here we go my chat with dr mohan krishna murthy who joins us from his home in brisbane australia mohan welcome to this podcast and thank you so much man for coming on thank you it's a pleasure and it's really nice to join you and the elite company that you have so it's uh, it's an honor really thank you Uh, I mean, pa. Thank you for that. Uh, so the idea of the show, Mohan, is to uh, inspire listeners and, of course, the host uh, from the habits, uh, mental models, and worldview of some very smart people. And you are definitely uh, someone who I definitely consider having that qualification. And it's it's for me, it's an absolute privilege to know you at a personal level. And sometimes I feel like the irreverent banter that we normally have, right? When you and I get together, we it's always you know a joke or you know something like it's. if i may and i don't mean to start this off on a very sentimental note or anything but that actually masks the amount of respect that i actually uh, have for you and that actually there's a lot that i've always wanted to ask you and i'm happy that we actually get this semi formal occasion to actually do it before you know we start making bad jokes about uh, board games and cricket and other things that happen on twitter so that's really the idea uh, idea for this Thank you, thank you, and and I'm super embarrassed at the moment. So it's a good place to put. <laughs> it's a good place to put your uh, your guest in. Uh, but yeah, I'm super embarrassed by the uh, the words you've said. I'm just uh, you know uh, just a normal guy, and and, and I and and the respect is mutual. That that's uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. that is something that I can definitely say. And and I, perhaps it's a nice um, thing for me to say right at the start. When I moved to India, and this is this is almost like um, the host taking over the show. But when I moved to India in 2010 to to do the six-year stint at IIT Bombay, at that time I had lost connect with 
India. I've lost connect, complete connect with India. Um, so it was a conscious decision to enter Twitter in a conscious way, in a, in a very, very deliberate way to try and connect with, uh, with the India that I lost connect with. I, I didn't know the young India. I didn't know if, um, young people and how young India thought and, and worked with. And I saw it through uh, the lens that people like you provided. And through that, you build camaraderie, you build trust. I mean, you build a, a, a view to an India through that filter, which was very, very useful for me in those initial days. Yeah. Um, so you, to me, uh, you know, I, I respect you for that, for, uh, for, thank you. for showing me the young uh, India that I'd lost. And, and, and if that was the goal, then uh, that was the Goldilocks period for you to have come on to Twitter, right? Anytime Indeed, yes. It have been too exotic and anytime after, of course, we know. Uh, uh, we know uh, we know what's happening. So uh, very, very interesting, Mohan. I think there are so many angles that we can actually approach this conversation. There's academics, fitness, your well documented love for uh, mountains and board games. But I want to start somewhere completely different, which is actually your sense of humor. Uh, you are without question one of the funniest and funnest people that I know. And this, despite having an official title that you know reeks of seriousness and stiff upper lipidness. Uh, I remember the story that either you or somebody else had told me where your secretary or research student had come to you with a lot of panic, something was going down, some deadline was arriving, something needed to happen and you were just quietly listening, nodding your head while she was all tense and when she was looking to you, but so she said, yeah, yeah, we'll solve all that, but just come and look at these beautiful pictures of mountains that I'm seeing and you were actually comparing a couple of destinations that you wanted to hike to. Uh, you know, I, I always think that you have this incredible ab uh, ability to just, you know, diffuse the situation. Uh, and when I say you have a sense of humor, it's not just that you by yourself are funny, which you absolutely are and sometimes can get very groan worthy as well as we all uh, well know. But it's also that you have this ability to just invoke fun, you know, like uh, it's like others themselves become funnier around you. So there are multiple questions that I want to uh, uh, ask over here. One is my essay. Do you think my assessment is correct for yourself? And uh, how important has humor and a sense of humor been for you personally throughout your life? And if I can then elevate it to a bigger question, how professionally important do you think it is to have a sense of humor? And maybe that's not specifically even with respect to your career or your field. Uh, very, very interesting observations. And I am guilty as charged. Let, let me start with that. I think we um, live in, a, in an extremely serious world. Um, we live in a world which, uh, in which we take ourselves too seriously, um, number one. And that then brings up a whole multitude of, of sins with it. So the first thing, um, and Australia has taught me that actually to a large extent, because probably when I moved here, I was way too serious. Um, and then Australians are pretty down to earth. I mean, they just call a, a spade a garbage truck, if, if, not, if not a whole garbage tip. So they're pretty grounded. They're pretty uh, brutal when it comes to uh, put downs and so on. So I think that enables us to to develop a, a sense of humor about any situation. It also level heads you to a large extent. It kind of puts you in your place. But more than that, it uh, it teaches you how to um, to take any situation with uh, with poise and, and and a bit of equanimity, um, if uh, if that's ever possible. I tend to use humor. To diffuse situations, you're right. Um, I I think any joke is worth laughing at. Uh, we laugh very little. I think as a people, if I may say this, I mean, uh, very right at the start, as a people, I think we, as in Indians in general, but more generally, we, humanity, we're pretty thin-skinned. But it's, it's therefore with some great interest that I'm actually observing the growth of stand-up comedy mm -hmm. in India. Uh, it is, without a doubt, the fastest growing market when it comes to the stand-up comedy market. Because if you start from the base of zero, there's a, the only place is up. <laughs> um, but uh, it is it is really with great interest that I'm observing it. Because um, a mentor of mine in India said, I wish Indians were less thin-skinned thin than we are at the moment. Oh. Um, uh, I don't want to name this person, but he's a, he's a top CEO um, in, a, in a big, big, big company in India. Uh, I, I have no problems mentioning him, but uh, he wouldn't want me to do that, I think. But he actually said to me once, I wish we as Indians were less thin-skinned than we are. But that's why I'm looking at the stand-up comedy movement in India, so seeing how beautifully it's growing. And it's growing from attacking other uh, sort of subcultures within India and sex within India. We're actually laughing at ourselves. The moment you start laughing at yourself, you get a sense of groundedness about who you are and all that sort of stuff. So any kind of humor is something that's good. I tend to use humor a lot in meetings. Only last week, 
we were talking about um, professional development and a new way of doing professional development in the organization that I'm, I'm part of. And they had four or five names for what they might call this new process uh, for appraisal and development. And one of them was uh, performance and development. Uh, and I said, look, I actually like that because the acronym is pretty good, PAD, PAD. And if someone wants to personalize it, they can make it iPad. And um, <laughs> cool with that. I mean, that was actually quite a serious discussion that was happening. And when I said this, the, the whole room burst into laughter like, you know, it was a stupid joke. But yeah. it just diffuses the situation completely. And people say, okay, let's look at it a bit more lightly. So that's what I do. In the midst of seriousness and everything that we do, which is serious uh, and, and very, very considered and strategic and um, boring at some time, it's quite useful to put that in perspective and humor does that. Yeah. Are you, are you, um, uh, something interesting you said was uh, you developed this um, during your time in Australia and you spent a fair bit of time uh, in the country. So while I'm guessing it worked well down under, um, when you came back to India, did you... Um, I mean, I'm assuming you carried forward that candor in uh, in some ways when you came back to India. So, uh, did you have a challenge over here, or was it just a matter of just you know, uh, like stand-up comedians would do workshopping, right? Or they would do trial sets before they take it to the public. Uh, so, did you have a situation? And I ask you this specifically because I think there might be others who want to try this at the workplace, but they may not want to, uh, but don't know how to approach it. So, I'm just keen to see. Oh, spot on. on. Oh, spot. You hit the nail on the head. It's very, very spot on. It's. I mentioned this mentor who said to me, I wish we had, um, we were able to develop a thicker skin. Mm. The context of that conversation was essentially how even humor doesn't help in some situations. Uh, I tried humor and, and it failed miserably. Uh, like, for example, at one point in time, there was a particular um, gentleman in, my, in the professional space I was working in. And instead of saying, look, no one's forcing you to do this, I said, look, um, I could hold a gun to your head, but it's not going to work. And that went on really like a lead balloon. It just didn't go well at all. Because the person actually say, thought of me as a person who might hold a gun to his head. And, and it didn't, didn't quite work. Uh, and there are several, several examples like that that mm-hmm. I can quote. But uh, you've got to do it carefully. You can't do it arbitrarily and assume that everyone will receive it yeah. in the way that you are telling it. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the context and the environment uh, really does matter quite significantly. I got burnt quite badly in the initial days because I was assuming that it would be received just as an Australian would receive it yeah. and, and give back. Uh, yeah. But many times it just bombed completely. And as a stand-up comic yourself, you know so many <laughs> sets that you think are brilliant yeah. will just bomb completely and you just have to develop steel and then try it again. Difference over there. I think there's a difference in uh, when you deliver a bad joke when people are expecting humor. So that's the you know, the stand-up comedian's worst nightmare, which is bombing on stage, but there people are in the mood to laugh, as opposed to making even an okay joke or at least just trying to diffuse a situation. may not even be with a joke per se. It might just be the yeah. way in which you're, you know, using certain language or something in a more in a professional setting. And at least I personally have found, and this might be, of course, uh, extend, uh, this might be because of the benefit of the nature of workspaces that I've been in, always in, uh, you know, uh, advertising or, spaces, yeah. or something like that, right? So there's no problem bringing jokes into the workplace in that from uh, in that sense. But yeah, you're right. I think it's something that needs to, uh, I think the lighter we lead our lives, the lower BP there is, the lower bullshit gets uh, propagated. And I think everyone's a lot more honest with each other. You know, Mohan, one of the quotes I remember from my time in advertising is, if you really want feedback from the client who you just presented an idea to, don't expect it in the room. Wait till you go down and have a smoke break with him. That's when you'll get the actual feedback. So now that sure. kind of is parallel to this. It's not necessarily with humor, but I think the common strain is just, lower it to a level where you can be honest with each other outside this so this formal environment uh it's interesting Probably. last year you know there's this book that's come out uh, recently which i'm yet to have a look at but it's making the rounds it's called uh, humor seriously why humor is a superpower at work and in life it's done Brilliant. by researchers uh one is called jennifer acker and the other is naomi uh, Bagdonas, and I'll link that in this uh, in the notes i've heard an interview with them that they did a couple of interviews with them because they're doing this book tour and it's exactly what you're talking about, workspaces, workplaces that have this sense of humor or at least uh, uh, professionals who balance competence with humor. You can't just be funny. You need to no. show that, you know, you're not just a joker. That's the thing. You can't no, that's right. right. There is that mix. I mean, if people will take you seriously, people will take, people will take your humor seriously, even in 
the environment I work in, which is academia, yeah. which is you know pretty serious. I mean, people in academia are pretty serious um, most of the time. But but people will take you seriously only if you're serious. If yeah. if you're serious about the work you do, um, they'll take your humor also seriously as a diffusing of a situation or a different way of looking at a situation. Yeah. If you're a joker all the time, then you yeah. get it. Um, that's the um, that's what we learn. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, and I and they had observations like uh, uh, the bosses that have a sense of humor have more loyalty from their uh, 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 from their. Um, colleagues and their reportees and companies that have a you know culture of a sense of humor actually performed some 20 25 percent better on some certain metrics i thought all that was kind of interesting and just shows that i think you know we are all just humans when uh, you don't uh, all this uh, all this uh, powerpoint tree that comes on top of that i think is just a way to uh, you know uh, enhance uh, uh, what uh, one writer once called bullshit jobs and just yeah. the, the real challenge and, and this is one uh, very early in the piece, when I started on my sort of leadership journey, oh, no, my second boss um, ever, he said two things which have always struck with me. He said, Mohan, show your vulnerability, but don't show it too often. Wonderful. Right? And the second thing he said was, when you use humor, use self-deprecating humor as well, as often Wonderful. as possible. Wonderful. These are two pieces of advice that I've never forgotten. If you're always vulnerable, then people don't take you seriously. Yeah. They think, the hell is going on? Right. <laughs> or if, if you use humor yeah. all the time, but sometimes put other people down or put situations down, but don't self-deprecate or self-denigrate. And again, people use, you know, see that kind of differently. And so these are two pe lovely pieces of advice that I got yeah. very early. Yeah. I was fortunate. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. That's actually a great way to sort of like round off that uh, fairly wide ranging question. I knew we'd have a decent discussion on it. And kudos to you for not making a sad joke uh, in that, but I'll, uh, I'll have, we'll have a quota for that. Later. I'm sure we will. Yeah, let's let's move on to academics, uh, Bohan. This is something that I've always been fascinated by. You are uh, one of the smartest people I know, uh, which you have displayed, and which your CV and LinkedIn profile obviously uh, uh, displays as well. Like remember, uh, so uh, when I, when I was stalking you online uh, under the guise of research for this um, for the for the show, I came across a CV of yours from 2010, which ran into seven pages. Uh, which is uh, which is absolutely astonishing. Um, so let's talk about that. I just want to uh, uh, talk about that for a while. You've been at this for a long, long time, right? Like when when I was, just for context for those who are listening, when I was born, Mohan was doing his MSc from Delhi University. Just to put things in, uh, just to put things in context. Thanks uh, for making me feel very, very old. Thank you. <laughs> the, that, that, uh, actually, the idea was to say that you've been in academics for a long time, but okay. sure, if that self-deprecatory humor is what you want to go for, then you go for it. So, Mohan, uh, seriously, how did you get into what you do today? Was it conscious to get into academics? And honestly, what just keeps you motivated to keep doing it? Very good set of observations and questions. I don't know how many pages my CV runs into now, but it is what it is. Uh, I, I've never worked on um, on building my yeah, CV yeah, uh, to like look at. That particular CV was that there was a BuzzFeed like list at the end as well, like top 10, top 10 research <laughs> papers. Like, wow, okay. <laughs> you know, it's like the greatest hits here as well. Uh, <laughs> this is a compulsive necessity in any academic CV. You, you might have, you know, I don't know, 200 publications or something else, something like that. But what are, what are the top 10? I mean, everyone includes that. In how do, how do you, how do you determine the top 10? Is it in terms of citations? Is it in terms Mostly. of... Mostly. 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 And this is unfortunate. This is the best paper that I think I wrote uh, is not on my top citations list. Uh, and it, But it is in my top 10. I have actually included it um, mm. in my top 10 list because I, I believe it is, yeah. without a doubt, the best paper that I've, uh, I've written, the best piece of work that I've been involved in. It hasn't received, unfortunately, the kinds of citations I thought it should receive, but then I always, uh, probably is my fault because I think um, the work that I do is always better than what I think it is, uh, what other th others think it is. I think this is true for any space of creation, right? Sometimes uh, metrics will say one thing and Correct. what you know is the best thing which might not be measurable in that sense. Like if you were to ask uh, for example, say I'm a writer, right? Sometimes I write articles and the articles that might in your equivalent make it to my top 10 list might be the mass things that I've written, maybe some observations around politics or something, which I know are going to get clicks and hence eyeballs uh, and things like that. Whereas uh, analysis or an opinion that I personally was very proud of uh, might be too esoteric or uh, the topic might be like, I was very proud of some of the things I wrote around how 
concerts are moving online for instance but the fact of the matter is only 10 people care about something like that even though i was very proud of how it came out yeah i think this is exactly right for uh, any industry really yeah but back to the question really how did you- yeah so I, I thought about this um, in in another context recently when someone asked me how I shaped my career. I actually didn't, okay. and it might actually frighten off some of your or, or give give the wrong message to some of your listeners. But I've always thought of myself as um, as a log floating in a river, but with a log with a mind, right? Uh, or log with a direction of its own. So I took where the river took me, uh, but when they were forked, I think I took the right forks a few times. Uh, or most of the times I took the right folk. So that's how I, I viewed my career. And I landed in academia kind of by default and where the river took me. But at one point in time, I had a choice. And I had to step back and, and think about the choice that I was making. For me, it was very simple. At that point in time, I just finished my master's in um, at Imperial College. At the end of my master's in Delhi, I did two master's. I did my master's in Delhi and then could have gone straight into a PhD. I decided to do another master's because I wasn't really sure. So that was one fork. I was attracted to academia, but I wasn't completely sure. So I did another master's, which is a one-year master, my master's at Imperial College in the UK. And at the end of it, I was sure that, that academia was what I wanted to do, simply because I valued freedom. I yeah. valued that in the, the freedom, the intellectual freedom that I could do anything that I wanted. The example that I quote and I cite very, very often is tomorrow, if I want to study the nocturnal habits of left-handed koala bears, I can, right? That's the, <laughs> not that not that I would jump in yeah, and start yeah, doing that, that. That came too quickly from you for you not to have thought about that before. It of seems course I have. I, that. I have cited this as an example in, 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 certain, um, in certain environments. Ah, okay. If I did want to do that, and provided someone thinks that's an interesting thing for me to do and fund me for it, I can do it. And so, so the thing that attracted me to academia uh, at the end of that one year the master's was I valued the freedom, the, the intellectual freedom, the academic freedom, uh, the freedom to be me. And that's something that I've always valued. It's interesting that you say this. I think about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, there was a guy called Nathan Hall who tweeted and said, if you could go back in time, to your en- younger academic mm. uh, role um, and uh, tell that younger person one thing you've learned about academia after 20 years in academia, what would it be? And the responses to that were so amazing. The tweet itself is quite amazing. You can actually tweet that about almost anything. Um, so basically saying if you could go back 20 years or 10 years or 15 years and tell that person one thing that you've learned about your journey, what would it be? The responses that, that were there, I hope someone curated it, but I was watching the responses as it came through. And, and some of them were um, actually reinforcing my own decisions. And part of that is, you know, be yourself, do things that you want to do. Of course, there's a lot of ego there, but there's also a lot of kindness there uh, in terms of making choices that you think will impact the world, yeah. making choices that you think will, will change the world around you or contribute to the world and leave behind an impact that other people can look at and say, hey, this was a good piece of work. This was a nice piece of work. This was good. This was something worthy to build on and so on. Um, so th- those are the things that, um, that I guess, um, drove me to, to make the choice to be an academic and then pursue it for, um, it's going to be about two or three years, about 30 years now. So That's fantastic. And, we are, and I'll find that uh, thread that you're talking about and I'll link it. Uh, in the notes uh, for this episode. It's, um, you know, the more I speak to people, uh, Mohan, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me that the, those uh, that it's not about uh, like building a career or, you know, building happiness and things like that aren't really about pursuing a particular path, uh, but about asking the right questions uh, uh, early on in your career or even when you're faced with like you very nicely put it like you're floating around like a log and you are you will be faced with forks at some point of time right be it right. should I join this college versus the other or should it be should I give up academia uh, at all and move to industry or should I get out of this altogether move to something else all these are uh, all these are sort of forks in the road what are the sort of uh, but you are driven I'm guessing by an internal set of values or an inter- like what are the questions or the uh, or uh, the metrics in some way that you had you that you used to help make these decisions because I think that will help somebody else 
who may not even be considering academics as a career as a career and i do genuinely hope that pe- it's not just people who are looking who are looking at that as a career get something out of this but to say okay hey i'm stuck in this particular job which might be in marketing which could be in finance okay these are the questions that helped mohan uh, or these are the values that help mohan decide what to do uh, right I, I, because i don't because increasingly i'm feeling it's not about saying hey pursue your passion because i think that's a uh quite silly statement uh, no it is it is me. so ultimately you know it is about defining what success means for you yeah you yeah. right so it's just it's just very very simple you can pare it down and and say what does success mean for me that will be different for different for people different. because your strengths and your goals are different to my strengths and my goals yeah. so if i define success by your strengths and your goals i'm going to be disappointed severely yeah. or or i'm just not going to get there and say you know what the hell have i done and uh, seeing what's it um, david burn who am i where where am i and how did i get uh, isn't there a song psycho killer wasn't it yeah yeah, uh, yeah in which in which he says this so you have to define what your strengths are and base your goals on your strengths and, and in my case my strengths and then that is focus and that is you know a, a drive to get things right mm-hmm. um and the freedom that i so much so so that then defines what success is for me it defines the goal and it, it defines then those things define what i want to measure yeah. my achievements against yeah i'm not going to measure my achievements against your goals and your success and your strengths right and we tend to do that a lot yeah we tend to define success in terms of uh, you know the number of hours we work uh, in terms of the salary that we have in terms of the house that we build and all that sort of stuff no i mean it, that's that is it may be success measure for for some but if it works for you then you take it out and work towards that so for me it was simply what my strengths were yeah and i completely focused that uh, my achievements and what i want to achieve based on purely my strengths so it was completely self centered and i i said this is what i want to do with my life this is what because these are these are my strengths Yeah. and that's what i want to do and so academia for me was a natural fit mm-hmm. um i knew what i wanted to do i knew what my strengths were and and, and work on yeah. work on things from that point of view yeah very very nice you said and i think this problem ironically is uh is more true for people who have a reasonably successful career successful from the traditional metrics that you said for example i'm already earning x amount of money it's a standard growth that's happening on the other side of things strangely enough if somebody has been like i mean uh, fired for instance now they are at the freedom to pursue a whole bunch of things purely because they are forced to in some oh, sense and i think that this uh, uh, you know the stagnation of momentum if that kind of makes sense because you're going along with the flow right you know how your career is going to shape up that's when you start getting to a rut more and more the uh, failure that comes because of success it's sort of like ironic um, any advice for people who might be in a situation like that who who's you know career is moving along but they're not particularly very passionate about it. every time they look at somebody say, yeah i wish i could do something but yeah i'm stuck in this sort of role which is you know predictable going along well totally but let me come back to let me start by uh, by something that struck me when you said about being fired and so on right i will come to the specifics of the question that you asked uh, how to deal with um, lack of success let's call it lack of success rather than failure but but um this conversation and the kinds of things that you're asking of people is so 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 relevant today mm. after the brutal 2020 that we've had many people have lost jobs um and probably feeling quite beaten up and brutalized at the moment uh, so this is a conversation that needs to happen yeah. uh, at a significant level at a global level if not a uh, national level And there are probably a lot of people who lost jobs and thinking and at crossroads thinking what am i doing where am i going um and it might be even more significant for them because they don't know where um their next paycheck loaf of bread that. right not maybe in this week but you know 6 weeks from now if they continue on the current path where is the next loaf of bread going to come from so this is a particularly relevant conversation given the time in which we are having it it's a strange world we live in Look, I've I've had lots of failures. Uh, you you start an experiment, you start a particular piece of work, you think you're going to hit the next, um, you're going to get the no- next Nobel Prize. We always start that with that thought when we start any particular program of research and get a, you know hugely excited by it. And a week down the track, we know that 
the proof that you're seeking. In, in my case, um, I'm a, an applied mathematician. The proof that you're, you're seeking doesn't quite work because some of the assumptions were wrong. I worked with a PhD supervisor, and this, this started at that time, right? I worked with a PhD supervisor who was extremely busy, and I couldn't really meet him too often. But I'd done a piece of work for about eight months. I hadn't met my supervisor at all. And at the end of eight months, he said, look, I mean, we have to meet. I said, yeah, you bet. <laughs> I've been working on this on my own. And I think it's, uh, I'm, I've hit a, a brick wall. And I started explaining what I'd done with the starting assumptions. And then I was three assumptions in uh, before I said, look, now then there's a proof, um, which uh, I actually managed to secure and therefore went into the implementation, which is not working. I listed down the three assumptions and he said, go back to the first one. And the very first one was wrong. Oh. The very first one was wrong. And there was a cascading effect from the assumption that I made and hence uh, a particular proof that actually worked, but the implementation was all wrong. Um, and it wasn't giving the results that I thought I would get. The very first assumption was wrong. And, he said, and I said, look, I've wasted eight months of my time in my PhD. And he said, no, not really. You learned a very important lesson. Um, and in any case, the fact that this didn't work because of the first assumption can still be a chapter in your thesis. And it was indeed a chapter saying, this is how not to do this. <laughs> Well, you, you turned a bug into a feature. That, that feature, exactly. Well, I didn't. My, my supervisor, my guide did. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. There, were, there were lots of failures. Uh, but early on in, in my career, I think I, I formed a, a necessary habit to cope with failure. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is that to, to understand, and this is particularly relevant to people who've lost their jobs and so on in the last year, success is always relative to opportunity. We really don't... Uh, we, we sometimes measure success in terms of what other people have achieved or what yeah. someone else is doing and so on. Success is always relative to individualized opportunities yeah. that are presented. Um, that doesn't mean we've got to be like a daisy girl. That doesn't mean that we have to be satisfied with mediocrity. It just means that as a statement, it stands on its own. Success is relative to opportunity. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, you fail, but we must learn how not to beat ourselves up when we fail. But I do beat myself up if I do not try. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's <clears throat> it's well put, right? You need to try things before, try a lot of things and I think that's um, uh, good advice to take away. We're going to take a short break and then we'll be right back with this conversation. Hey everybody, let me tell you a little bit about what happened on the IVM Podcast Network this week. On Cider Says, Cyrus was joined by Irfan Pabani, who is an old friend of his. They talk about the rich flavors of Indian food and Parsi food specifically. He was also joined by author and historian William Dalrymple. They discuss literature, history, and the culture of the Indian subcontinent. And let me give you a few quick things to check out. Chuck, a.k.a. Deepak Gopal Krishnan of Simplified and the Origin of Things frame, has Rohan Joshi, formerly of AIB, on his show. Also on this round is on me, Gautam Puroit of Thakur's Bojnale was on. On the note, Maruk and I talks about the cabinet reshuffle. And do check out Global Victoria Tech Talks. We talk about the booming gaming and edgy tech industries in Australia. Do follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram to keep up what's going on on the network. And I'd like to finally thank our sponsors on the network this week, Cred, Siet, and Global Victoria. Thank you so much for making this possible. And now back to my conversation with Mohan Krishnamurti. Mohan, uh, you've been a teacher for a long time. Uh, so mm-hmm. really, what makes a good teacher? Wow. If I can inspire others to do good things, that's all I want. I want to inspire other people to do good things well. Um, and that might be you know, looking after the world around us. That might be you know, taking up endurance sport. That might be any, anything that you might want to do. Or, or, you know, quantum physics. Some of my PhD students have gone on to do some really brilliant things. And it, it makes me incredibly happy to see their success. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, as a teacher, I want to see, um, as a PhD guide or a, or a teacher, I want to see my students do incredibly well. If they do better than me, good luck to them, really. Uh, yeah, so that's the one thing that I want to leave behind as a teacher or a guide inspire people to do good things really well. The choices that people make, the choices not just about the work that they do, but about the life they lead. Uh, as long as they're doing good things, that's all I want as a teacher. I may not have taught them you know, the best uh, maths that I know, but if I teach them about pursuing things that they want and leaving an impact on the world around them, that's much more than sufficient for me. That's exactly what I want to do. That's wonderful. I, I came across a completely different uh, industry. I came across this lovely thread 
uh, recently about what makes a good uh, business in this day and age. Uh, and somebody said, if you're building a platform, then you will be successful only if those using your platform end up being successful, right? A Shopify will become successful only if the merchants that list on Shopify, they end up making are successful. Themselves, are successful themselves. That's the only way or the people who are using MS Office uh, will use that output of MS Office to, you know, whatever, further enhance their careers or to make uh, the thing. It's not just because they're using your platform that you will get money. That's not a very sustainable moat. He said it more from a business moat point of view, but I think the parallel is kind of same over here, right? You become a good teacher only if in some sense your students can multiply what you are seeking to do in some sense. Right? Was, uh, there's, a, there's a nice anecdote that I can quote. And I, uh, again, I, I wouldn't cite, I wouldn't give the name of the person that said it, but a very, very famous musician uh, in India. Um, I was promoting him in, in Australia. And he was here with his group about a week before the show. And every day, sometimes three, four times a day, he would ask me, um, how is the show going? Is it going well? Are you doing well with the, with the tickets? And are you doing well? How is the show going? How is the show going? And probably on the third or fourth day, um, I actually asked him, so where is this question being driven from? And he sort of preempted where I was going with it. And he said, look, I will get paid for my show. Even if two people are in the audience, I will get paid for my show. From now on, my success is purely dependent on your success. Wow. Okay. That's quite amazing. I reflected on that and, and said, and he, and he actually said it, even if two people are in the audience, I, I've got paid already. But my success was purely defined from now on on your success. Yeah. yeah. And he went on to say, of course, from a selfish point of view, if you're success, you'll invite me back. But that's a different matter. Yeah. You'll invite other people. You'll yeah. continue to be successful. And you'll promote the art. That was quite profound. That was quite profound. That's amazing. And I know who you're talking about. And uh, that it's just amazing that, uh, uh, just take it from me that it's a fairly big artist that we're talking about. Uh, yes. And it's amazing that that happened. And there's so, I mean, there's so much to unpack over there, right? I mean, that, that's so profound by itself. And what an impression that must have left on you for, uh, for amazing. How, uh, amazing. how inspiring that must have been. All right. Um, uh, just coming uh, back to this academy. So I've noticed over the last 10 years, and this could be a very cursory reading of your academic career. So forgive me if I've like misread it completely, uh, completely wrong. I've noticed that over the past 10 years, you've mostly been in partnership based roles. Uh, right. Uh, so, for example, the IITB uh, and Monash University partnership, and even before that, everything from 2010 onwards has been some partnership yeah. or the other. Right. So, is the, is this something that you got into deliberately, uh, or just something you uh, stumbled upon? And secondly, like, tell me a little bit about the power of you know these partnerships, not just for academia, but uh, also possibly for industry and society, because I'm guessing uh, these partnerships go way beyond just one university talking uh, uh, talking to the other and in some sense could even end up being like uh, getting outside the bubbles that people are in, people or industries are totally. in. Totally. And for, for me, collaboration and partnership uh, have defined my, my, uh, my career as well. I decided very early in the piece that I, I will work on interesting problems with people. Mm -hmm. Um, simply because we bring different skills to the table. And um, it is necessary to solve today's problems. We need multidisciplinary approaches to solving problems. We need different sets of people looking at problems but to come up with solutions that, are, that last beyond the paper that's written. Mm -hmm. So I really have been working on working with good people all the time. Collaborate with the, I collaborated with some amazing people, people that I like, some of them I'm still working with and so on. So then it was natural that I would bring that to, um, to the university's uh, sector that I'm part of to encourage, to drive and to deliver uh, partnerships and collaborations that actually work. From a simple metrics point of view, it is, it, it's, it's very clear that if you have international collaborations, the citations that you get from the paper uh, trebles. Yeah. There's, a, there's a factor of one, one is to 2.8 or something like that, uh, close to 2.8. One is to 2.8. I, like I like how somebody st actually studied that. Well, yeah, there are, there are pieces of work that actually look at yeah, how, absolutely, how international collaborations specifically between labs increase the citations that you get from a paper. So, say it's very simple. You have one lab, let's say, in Australia and another lab, let's say, in Switzerland. If they publish the paper within the lab, 
just the people in the lab will cite yeah. that piece of work again, or the friends of the people in that lab will cite mm-hmm. that piece of work, or people who've seen the work of the of that particular lab will cite the work. But if there are two labs, automatically you have two sets of influ- influences that are built up yeah. automatically. Yeah. So at well, least the fact of two. it also acts as a signal to the rest of the world, right? That oh, two labs. Yeah. Now, so it has a it's it's a more than it's some. got a multiplier effect. Yeah. And that multiplier is roughly about 2.8. I mean, there are there various I'm studies. I say 1 plus 1 equal to 3. And they're like, wow, that's extremely close to 2.8, which we mentioned a while back. Right. And, and, and that, that always happens. So, so I've, been, I've been quite strongly, um, uh, you know, I've been advocating the, the kinds of partnerships that, um, that we need. Now, Australia, of course, the number of students, at PhD students, uh, it's, it's either static or flattening uh, or, or decreasing even. So, you just have to go to where the talent is. Mm-hmm. So um, I've been a, a strong advocate of uh, partnerships between Australia and India, and that hence the IIT Bombay Monash partnership, hence the UQ IIT Delhi partnership, and there'll be many, many more uh, uh, such partnerships um, from a collaboration point of view. But not just with India; it's also with uh, with China, with um, with UK, and 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 uh, every every other place that we can we can work with. That that. That's basically the the driver for the many of the partnership related activities that I've um, I've done. Different cultures, different lenses enable us to look at the same problem differently. And purely from the point of view of international collaborations, you know, you different outlooks um, and and different hygiene factors in different labs will give you different ways of looking at things yeah. and contribute to impact in, in in much more significant ways. The other aspect of this is if I work in Australia and deliver results in Australia, my work is all about impact and translation, right? The immediate ability to translate is within the Australian context, right? Of course, if it is highly successful, it can be the global context as well. And many of our inventions have a global impact. But the moment you collaborate with a lab, let's say in India or in Switzerland or in England, the opportunity to translate that work into practice is suddenly double, if not even higher than that. Mm-hmm. So that, that then lends itself to greater collaboration. Collaboration is hard. Partnerships are hard, but um, it's necessary. No, and I think there are so many other parallels we can draw, the, uh, draw with your other passions uh, as well. Uh, for example, two rivers coming together. Uh, that exactly. is something that we have... Uh, 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 spoken about a lot during that uh, uh, Himalayan trek of us. And even if you take over, take music, for instance, I've always been fascinated by how different uh, cultures or different st- types of music come together and make something that's uh, uh, completely different, uh, which are sometimes un- quite uncharitably gets all clustered under fusion. But I think it's uh, uh, something that's more than that. I think also, I mean, looking at it from a musical context, it also helps shake things up. Uh, and, totally. right? Like if, if you were to just look back at the pioneers of music, no matter which genre you're looking at, uh, none of them just improved on what the previous person was doing. It's always uh, like I, for, like, for instance, I was seeing a documentary on the Beatles recently and uh, they were great, not just because they took what bands before them were doing and played better chords or something like that, mm-hmm. but they just approached it completely differently. Their influences were a combination of the pop of the day and classical music and church music and things like that. Amazing. And, uh, music like Eleanor Rigby, etc. Came, uh, came around. Even if you think about from an Indian context, a band like pioneering bands like Indian Ocean, for example, they took uh, what uh, Bollywood could do and what um, a rock band could do and merge them together to create a unique style. It's quite interesting when you talk about uh, totally. I mean, if you and if you look at, I mean, I, you 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 did mention the the word fusion, which which gives me a bit of an allergic rash. Yeah, exactly. um, <laughs> fusion for me is is, is uh, you know it's time for us to do one of our things, our, our puns, right? Yeah. Fusion for me is complete confusion. Um, <laughs> and then, but um, if you take the work, um, going back, you take the work that. Peter Gabriel did, for example, and we're talking about Beatles and so on, but, uh, and absolutely yes, but, but there are so many musicians who did some amazing crossover work, and I use crossover rather than, than yeah. uh, crossover yeah. influences yeah. rather than fusion, simply because I don't think you can shake the very foundations of rock or very foundations of classical music, but there is a crossover point where you say, I'm influenced by that, but not enough to lose my own roots and my own integrity yeah. to what I'm doing. But I'm super influenced by what you're doing. So then you have Peter Gabriel that worked with Yusundor, for example, to bring uh, to to sing 
uh, in your eyes, right? which yeah. is so beautiful, or, or so many other examples, right? So you have those kinds of influences where you say, I'm still, uh, or, or Paul Simon, who did some brilliant work with, uh, uh, with uh, African bands. So you have that. And, and more recently, there have been so many good examples in India. And you are, as an expert of progressive rock, you would know um, a lot of that stuff. Agam, for example, some of the stuff that they're doing, uh, or Kaikuram Bridge. And I mean, you know, you, you know all these bands. But the work, some of the work that they're doing is so amazingly good. Um, and good luck to them. Um, yeah. good, absolutely good luck to them. But simply, it is a question of, I'm honest, I'm true to what I'm doing, but I'm not uh, completely oblivious to or shutting the door on influences that my principles and my values have from other cultures, other uh, genres and so on. That's, yeah. that's essentially the losing of ego, but not identity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned Taikudam Bridge because their uh, latest album, Nama, uh, which was released in 2019, had collaborations ranging from Vishamohan Bhatt uh, to Chris Adler, who used to be the drummer of uh, death metal band Lamb of death God, metal. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jordan Rudess, who is a virtuoso keyboard player for... Uh, Dream Theater and Niladri Kumar. So it's like goes all over the place. It's uh, uh, Rakesh Chaurasia, uh, Guthri Govan, who's another famous uh, British uh, progressive rock guitarist. So yeah, it, but it's all of it. It's not like they're trying to be that band or that genre. Right. They're very rooted in what they do. And this just adds another element to it. Fascinating. I think there's so much that we can talk about uh, just collaboration. But I think we've spoken enough about Academy. So the last question on that space that I really want to ask you is about what you do, which is in the space of, uh, uh, which is in the space of mathematics. And I, we, we've spoken about maths before. And we've, uh, you, uh, in fact, that's the first podcast conversation that we've had when you came on to Simplified all those years ago and spoke about your love for mathematics and uh, uh, and and what it has the potential to do. If I remember, we spoke about the traveling salesman problem at that point. Mm-hmm. Of time. It's very hard to uh, uh, to explain it to three uh, duffers who's, who forsake calculus uh, long back. If you were like, Mohan, this is sort of like a very much broader question. So if you were to sort of restructure education in India and indeed around the world, how do you make kids fall in love with numbers or science? And I realize this is a very, very difficult question, but I'm sort wow. of accepting this. You sort of thought about, uh, I mean, this is common joke that, uh, uh, this is a very common joke that, uh, you know, uh, uh, young adults are asked a very pertinent life question, which they should be knowing. And they look blank for a while and they say mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. Poor mitochondria <laughs> has taken a lot of flack for, uh, flack for this. Uh, but but I think it points to a larger malaise, if I may use uh, the word, right? This is... It is. There are two aspects here. One is, you know, if you take STEM education in general, right? You know, without being doomsday scenario about it. Uh, we are at a, at a significant crossroads. We have very few people interested in STEM, um, very few people taking up STEM, uh, but more significantly, very few people taking up maths in our university sectors and so on. If they do, the method of education is, uh, leaves a lot to be desired as well. I think COVID can help address that significantly um, in a curious kind of way. We've had last year to step back and, and see, you know, how do we impart our education in a way that it becomes exciting and interesting and engaging to people who are not in the classroom, especially in a country like Australia, where nearly... Um, one third of our students are actually sitting somewhere else in another country because they've registered uh, for courses in Australia, but they're not able to travel yeah. to Australia. They're sitting in China or in Indonesia or Vietnam or Malaysia or Singapore or India and uh, taking our courses from uh, remotely from here. To keep people engaged, to keep people uh, interested, young kids interested and engaged and involved in the course in, in, in education at distance in a remote sense has taught us completely different sets of skills that will now hopefully help us address what's actually happening in, in STEM. What can we do to reignite excitement in STEM, uh, and particularly mathematics? Um, because we need it. We absolutely need it. And there are experiments going on where you know we have STEM fused with liberal arts uh, and um, you have interwoven learning and so on. There's a university in India that's, in fact, two or three that are, that are actually trialing this. Um, one called Kriya, which comes to mind immediately, K-R-E-A, I don't know if you know it, but they're doing some really interesting things. So I'm watching all those experiments very, very carefully to see what might come out of it. These are experiments at this stage, right? Because we need to now look at significantly different ways to do uh, do our training. 
In an Indian context, the national education policy, which was redrafted last year after about 34 years, about time, um, and it might give us ways in which we can impart education differently to what we're doing. At the moment, it's rote learning and exam-based learning um, rather than educating people to think critically. Yeah. Ultimately, education is about critical thinking. Yeah. How do you develop methodology around it? How do you develop process around it? How do you develop learning and structured learning around it? But ultimately, it's about critical thinking. Um, and if you can do that and excite a bunch of people in, in uh, STEM, particularly mathematics, because ultimately that's about logic, that's about rational, you know, rational thoughts or structured thinking. That's what we should be doing in our education, not learning for exams. And uh, unfortunately, that's what we've been doing for a long, long, long time. Yeah, yeah. And maths, unfortunately, also gets, um, uh, it also gets a short end of the stick that, in that sense, right, where it's, uh, it's about how do you do maths quicker rather than how do you actually enjoy maths because mathematics is so precise and i was absolutely in love with uh, maths as a, as a student myself and i i remember like when you were saying this it just struck me that i hated shortcuts when i was studying maths because to me the it wasn't about solving i hated the concept of vedic maths for instance purely because that was a way to get to a cat answer quicker right not putting down vedic maths so if anyone's listening in out no no that's really not what I'm talking about over here. For, my, for me, the whole thing was, no, I want to go to the beauty of this. I want to see how this and this actually end up being this. And, uh, you know, because of the pressures that you have of time and, you know, wanting to having to get marks quicker, I think that beauty gets lost out in some sense. And I saw the same thing with another sort of related field, which was computer programming, where the idea was mm -hmm. more to write efficient code rather than hey, the same thing. What if we approach it in this way? It could lead to other answers. Well, I'm totally like on board. Uh, with you for that and I've seen some YouTubers for instance uh, create some absolute magic around uh, science and maths and the things like Kursegast being one of my yeah. favorite channels from uh, from Germany for example. Mohan, yeah. while it might be too late for any of our listeners to go back and uh, you know start studying maths all over again, any sort of um, popular science type recommendations that you have, maybe a book or something that just helps people fall in love with the concept of mathematics again, even if it doesn't necessarily make them you know calculus geniuses at the end of it no not at all so so this, uh, so when i say not at all not at all late to, to fall in love with uh, with science and maths never 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 uh, too late um, for that there there are you know there are so many good youtube uh, the cursor guys that you said you talked about right the german show beautiful beautiful way to to, to fall in love with uh, and if you can link that in this yes. uh, in no, this cast, linking, yeah. please do because you know something like that is so simple. People traveling by train for an hour or something like that to work, and inevitably in Bombay you need to do that, or in Delhi you need to do that, uh, or, or wherever your your listeners are. Just listening to that, just just getting excited by um, uh, by that is, is for me. You know, there was a, a talk that I attended. There were times. Mm -hmm. To be perfectly honest, there were times in my career when I said, what the hell, we, we're doing all this science and all this maths, I mean, three people reading it, ten people citing it. Um, is it really going to create impact? I went to uh, a talk by a guy called Dr. Carl, Carl Kruzneski, I think is his name. I can link it. I can send you a link to, to his article. Supremely funny guy. He's actually a stand-up comic, but a mathematician. And another guy called Adam Spencer. Uh, Adam is a Triple J radio show host. He hosts um, uh, rock music shows on Triple J, which is the ABC uh, radio. But he's also a mathematician. He's got a glass eye and he talks really funny. Uh, so Adam Spencer has got a match show as well. Uh, and, and these guys, I, I, I listened to them. I, I went to a talk by Dr. Carl, who, whose talk was the power of the colon. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what, what is he talking about? So he talked about the power of the colon. I thought, I went into the, into the talk, it was at a comedy festival, and I thought it was something to do with uh, the colon, the, the intestine, right? And, and it actually was, the entire talk was a statistical analysis of how the presence of a colon in a, in a paper title increases its citability. <laughs> in that talk, he brought in so many examples, and he reviewed so many papers uh, that had a colon in it, right? But the talk was a part of the colon, and he brought in methods of bibliometric analysis and so on into his talk. It's so incredibly interesting. Um, so there are people like that that you can follow and you can just read and you can just 
uh, understand from them the way they think and the way they approach the topic that they are talking about. So um, there, is, there are ways, there are tools, there are mechanisms there that enable you to fall in love with the thinking process rather than just the science. There are two things that are important. The definition of the problem, how you think about the problem, and what the impact is of the work that you've done. That's just the three things that you need to know. How do you define the problem that you want to do? What's the methodology? What's the process of investigation? And what is the outcome of what you've done? And if you can just understand those three things from any piece of work, yeah. your take home is much more powerful than anyone else that can actually look at it cursorily. So that's something that I would really encourage uh, people to do without really getting bogged down by understanding the science or the understanding the difficulties that the scientist was able to address. Yeah. What is the problem? How did you define it? What are the, uh, how did you define it? What are the processes and steps that you undertook? What's the outcome? That's all you need to know. Do you think there's a sort of, I mean, just uh, tossing the ball back to academia for a while. Do you think that there's a gap there in terms of uh, uh, totally. pop sci pop Popular scientifying, if I may, the research and the work that uh, happens. Oh, totally. I mean, we are, I mean, as a scientist myself, I mean, we are our worst enemies. <laughs> to, we, we try and keep it away from people rather than bringing people into it. Yeah. Um, and, and there is a, a mythical dimension to it uh, that says, you know, this is all too precious. Let's just keep it to ourselves and so on. No, that, that, that's wrong. It's not quite pop sci, but getting people excited and interested in the science that they do uh, by simplifying it, by what it is, how without going into too much of the details. Yeah. Um, for people who want to scratch the details, they'll find it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's and it. yeah, today's world, everyone is, every, everything is discovered. Yeah. So yeah. you really don't need to spend too much time on, on the details of what you did. Yeah. But how you did it, how you thought about it, how you decoded it, and how you processed it, and then what was the outcome of yeah. what you did. That's all yeah. people need to know. Lower, lower the entry barriers. Uh, as a, as totally. As I'd be very keen to see whether, like, for example, um, a show like The Big Bang Theory, for instance, which, let's face it, is not great comedically, at least in the last uh, paper of, of a fair bit. I, I'd be very interested to see whether that actually got people interested in, say, theoretical physics or uh, quantum physics. You know the theory, right? The, the CSI show increased the number of people who were interested in forensics. Interesting. Um, yeah, by a factor of five, apparently. So there's a huge number of people who are suddenly interested in, in criminology and forensics yeah. from just one show. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm hoping that there will be shows like this. that Some in the spotlight. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But make it exciting enough for people to get attached to and attracted to. So that, you know, it's not just the people who are already geeks who are attached to this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the people who, you know, would like to be geeks but don't know how, right? Uh, so I you need you need some of what they do in some sense. Of course, yeah. of course, yes. Mm. Fascinating. I think that's I, I think I think that's great. And uh, I, let's I think we spend a lot of time on cats. So let's move on to something else. But before that, Mohan, I'm proud to say that I have a name for your uh, thesis on uh, on left-handed koalas. It's <laughs> South Paw Paws from the South. So there you go. It's, uh, it's a free title <laughs> to use. So. Can give me credits in your paper if you want. It's the only way I'm ever go. Going. Can can go for it. That could form. that could be the title. That could well be the title of this particular show. <laughs> <laughs> South Park, Boston, from the South. I think you got a title. That. All right, let's move on to another thing that you're very passionate about, Mohan, which is fitness. Mm -hmm. right. One of the fittest guys I know, and at the and you're 52 as of last count. Uh, no. <laughs> This is for all listeners. There was this joke that um, uh, you know every year we would celebrate Mohan's fiftieth birthday, and uh, we we won't uh, ask you to reveal uh, the actual count. But I think just let it just to everyone who's like listening, I can see Mohan as part of the Zoom call, and I, he would not look a day over fifty. Uh, you look that fit and sprightly. Uh, okay. If I may, uh, Mohan frequently treks, uh, and by that I mean the Himalayas, not Sanjay Gandhi National Park, and now <laughs> has taken to cycling, which used to be my thing, but now uh, he's taken he's ta he's taken that uh, over completely. So I, I'm very curious to know, Mohan, like were you always this way? What is your fitness story? Do you have like a crisis at some point of time, and then you got into this as a result of that? So just generally been curious about your fitness journey, as it were. Just like how you <laughs> partly crisis, partly hatred. So I'll, I'll talk about the crisis and then the hatred. Um, the crisis was as a young lad, I had severe asthma. Oh, so oh, I still do. I still, um, <laughs> I said this to a friend of mine yesterday, just yesterday, in fact. And he said, 
you are an insult to asthma <laughs> 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 so so essentially i i still do i still have i before a cycle ride or something like that i take a couple of puffs of ventolin before i i set off uh, because i just don't know what it might be yesterday's ride um today's sunday and yesterday's ride saturday ride was cancelled because i pulled out of it because saturday uh, friday night it was an asthma night for me and i decided not to ride i could have ridden uh so yeah so one is i uh, am um a fitness fiend if you could call it or, or a person that really it you know likes engaging in, in fitness activities simply because it's a way to keep my asthma at bay um i wish i could swim i can't and that's the only regret that i have from a fitness perspective that i can't swim i don't swim i just something happens when i hit the water and i just go i, I meet the bottom of the pool very very quickly <laughs> not it's impossible not, to do that you know that right? <laughs> unless you have something tied to you i i don't know that's the one regret that i have but other than that i've always um so there's the that element to my fitness which uh, resulted from um uh, i think a chronic crisis but i i decided i think when i was 15 16 or something like that that this i can't be this way i have to do something and slowly got into the fitness activities and used to play games a lot and but especially games like badminton and yeah. and, and and so on that make you you know do short spurts very very quickly and then slowly increase my fitness and then stuck to running and running was just amazingly um a wonderful way to do that and then squash and a whole bunch of other things and trekking mountaineering and and now for the last two year three years now cycling um which which uh, it's just such fun but yeah that's that, so partly because of that and i talked about hatred as well the hatred is simply i have a profound hatred for the south indian carb laden ponds um I, i just can't stand it i just can't and for me so that that image of the i mean i say south indian but it's it's more gentle than that Yeah. um and i don't want your south indian listeners to start throwing bricks at the show but you know basically the the carb loaded ponds yeah yeah rice a ra- thai southern ponds or rice ponds or whatever you might want to call it uh, from a very very young age i said no way i mean that's that's definitely not what i want to do so it's partly crisis partly partly the hatred of that particular more than the uh, revulsion revulsion is a much better word you you're good with english and yeah. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and there is a third thing which is i crave for and it sounds a bit weird but i crave for the loneliness that uh, that this kind of pursuit uh, provides me i am actually quite an introverted person uh, but my job forces me to interact with people so a lot of my energy is expended in that interaction mm. so this is now me building up the reserve of that energy again in pursuit I mean, if i'm running you know 16 15 kilometers or so that's about 2 hours on the road just for myself if i'm riding it's about 4 or 5 hours just Well, not quite by myself. There's always someone there. Yeah. But you're not talking with them all the time. You, you know, they're there. You know, I, remember I ride with two, three other people sometimes. Um, but every now and then, we might have a quick burst of conversation, and then I'm, you know, left to my own thoughts. So it's a bit selfish, but it's it's a way for me to recharge and grow and build up my energy reserves again. So it's crisis, hatred of the punch, and loneliness as well, which uh, which drive me to these things. Uh, that's that's uh, very interesting. <laughs> I view interesting enough driving is the one thing that I guess you don't do in that sense. But Amon, you started. You had this realization at fifteen, sixteen, which is my guess is there'll be a lot of people over here who are either a little academical about their own uh, fitness. Might be much, much later than that. Maybe late twenties or even mid, uh, maybe even mid thirties. Uh, how I, I I mean, the earlier you get started, obviously the better. But uh, like. how can like they start incorporating some type of fitness into their life you'll always have the same old excuse right no too busy to do this and like what can they get started with yeah you know what i mean this is a very simple thing it can be very very selfish motivation your drive to a fitter person actually improves your confidence to for me it does for me it did throughout my 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 life with career the ability to go faster or better than you did yesterday or do things differently to what you did last week it just provided me in in a very very you know uh, self absorbed way you can see it way it gave me confidence so if that is the only thing that you get out of this pursuit that's good yeah. for me it gave it gave confidence it, of course it also did the other thing which is kept my asthma at bay it keep my revulsion of the punch at in check and it gives me that lonely time or alone time or my time mm. to do the things that i want to do but there's another thing as well i mean Not so south. Me included. I, I, I'm my family is diabetic, so I don't know when I might. But this will delay the onset, yeah. if at all. 
uh, or might completely remove it from my uh, from my journey. But everyone in my family is diabetic. But I wouldn't be alone. There'll be lots of people. In, uh, diabetes is one of the the big pillars in in India, especially the amount of sweets that are consumed and so on. So this is something that we at one level we must do. But at a very selfish level, it it gives it it improves my confidence significantly by knowing that I can lift, for example, two kilos more on a bench press than I did last week. Right? It's just simple things like this that give you the ability to say, "I can do it. Mm-hmm. I've done it. I can do it." And if you don't, it makes you work towards how you can do it better. Yeah. Or if you climb a mountain uh, and and you fell short on the, uh, well, I'm I'm talking about riding uh, riding a bike on a mountain and you fell short of the top. Uh, by a little bit, and you know that you need to do a little bit more work mm. on your legs to get you to that point. Yeah. It gives you, it provides structure, it provides uh, an ability to to define what you want to do, and then ultimately it gives you confidence as well because you've done it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like in short, like what you're saying is uh, doing these things, even if let's say the worst case that you don't necessarily enjoy doing it, it has the benefit of. Helping you do the things that you actually care about, work, Correct. or the things Correct. that you have to do, it Correct. helps you structure your thoughts or makes you uh, slightly more confident. That that's a, I think that's a great way of looking at it. And also, you mentioned you may not like to do, yeah. But if you stick at it, right, there is another thing that you get out of it. The endorphins kick in, right, yeah. and that gives you the motivation automatically. I mean, you might say, "Oh God, do I need to do this today?" But then the endorphins kick in as well, and they help. Right, it's getting started. Like once you cross those first five minutes, then you're in it. You're in it. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. It's just about shutting up, uh, uh, just uh, uh, marking out time for it, uh, and just getting started. I think that uh, once that barrier is crossed, I think this is the first couple of minutes. The moment you put your shoes on, I think a great a great tip that's uh, a great thing that's helped me when I've been uh, so during lockdown I've been doing these group classes. So I, one thing mm-hmm. I do is uh, uh, I just keep the shoes and everything right right over here so that you know the barrier is uh, is that much less. You know, there's an old cartoon that I, I I read very very long back, and I am one of those guys who takes a lot of life lessons from very silly cartoons and comics that I read long back. And this is a cart and uh, like this is a, I'm, I'm not even sure if you might have heard of this uh, comic strip. It's a series called Drabble, D R A B B L E, uh, which features <laughs> like. Um, you, you know, it's very Simpsons-like in the sense that the dad is like this overweight, lazy, beer-drinking sort of, but good-natured kind of goof, you know. <laughs> um, and he was, he's a mall cop. That's his job. He's a mall cop. Mm-hmm. He was, you know, dressing up to be a mall cop and everything. And like, he was like, put, he put on his hat, shoes, sing, uniform and everything. And then he got into bed. And then his wife says, the things that you won't do to get an extra two hours of sleep in the morning. I like that's genius. That is brilliant. Like I wouldn't put on my work clothes, sure, but if I can make it easier for me to go of from bed to uh, work or some workout or gym or some whatever. So yeah, so if any of you want to, uh, you know, uh, work out in the morning, just wear your exercise clothes on. They're super comfortable as well when you go to sleep and uh, keep your. That, that's that is also my tip. That my tip is to. Uh, it is to, it's better to get rid of it. I'm almost saying that you know something that yeah. you have to do is just get rid of it and get it done with. Uh, but my tip is to do it in the morning to, to yeah. actually do the gym work in the morning. Simply, from in my case, it gets my blood flowing through the day. You, you know, wonderfully. I mean, my heart rate's up. I'm, I'm really buzzing, and I'm at work, and I'm uh, I'm doing uh, I'm yeah, doing stuff. Also have this, just to go back to your older point of or oh, that earlier point of uh, confidence, it just seems like yeah. If nothing else. Even if work is bad today, I at least I've done that, and that is that's it. Challenging. That's it. That's, that's exactly, exactly right. right. Yeah. Let's move mm-hmm. on to possibly what I know is your biggest passion point, at least from my point of view. Of course, that is the mountains. Uh, your yeah. well-documented love of the mountains. I know this is something that you can possibly spend another three hours talking about. Uh, so, how did that happen? When did trekking become so important to you? I. Uh, this is beautiful note that you had written once about uh, the mountains are calling. Uh, I yes. must go. It's, it's an astonishing piece, uh, which I will also make sure I link out over here. But I'm okay. just curious to know, uh, Mohan, like how did uh, this love for the mountains come about? One and uh, you have had this. Uh, I remember at that point of time when we had done that uh, trek together in 2014. I think it was 14. 14. 14. Correct. Uh, where you said, uh, you know, you wanted to, or you were trekking once every year. I'm not sure if you've done that in the last couple of years or so, but at least 
like the fact that it was a regular thing for that long a period of time itself is uh, quite remarkable so just curious to know about the whole thing how it came about what mountaineering means to you now oh it means a lot it always has meant a lot i have been trekking for a long 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 time so most saturdays when i was so i my, my journey i went from india to uk to australia back to india for 5 years and now back in australia everywhere i've been uh, i've trekked the uk doesn't have very tall mountains um but i did in europe uh, a few treks australia also doesn't have very tall mountains um but i've trekked quite extensively quite quite a lot in in australia i like that as a pursuit with friends i like the fact that we can walk we can talk we can conquer difficulties along the way and actually enjoy the outdoors in in a way that uh, we can't in a city life so that that's something that i've always done sometimes on weekends sometimes long weekends just go away somewhere for you know two or three days do some day treks come back and um, enjoy the outdoors enjoy the again there's a sense of loneliness as well to that entire pursuit my himalaya trek started with a very very simple small trek to a place called kuari pass not far from where we went uh, the park when we went to pangarchula and yeah. um uh, kuari pass is not very far from from pangarchula um it's actually a pass um but the approach to the pass is very interesting and that's when i said look this is something that i have to do so the kuari pass approach itself um that was my first himalaya trek Kuari Pass itself, I, 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 I'll, I might get the number wrong. You can actually confirm it um, by looking at the web after this. It's only at about three thousand six hundred meters or so. I'm saying only, but no, even three thousand six hundred meters is significant. We don't have mountains of three thousand six hundred um, that many mountains in in in, um, in this part of the world. The pass is at three thousand six hundred meters. The approach, you actually are uh, looking at the ground in front of you. It's almost steep. Uh, the approach to the pass. So when you get to the pass. um and stand on the pass which is basically a, a a u a cradle right you stand there and look at the the sheet of white in front of you there's a sheet of mountains in front of you and you see some amazing mount right in front of you if i remember right from kwari pass you see a mountain called dronagiri right which is um mythically the mountain that hanuman cut out and took to sri lanka because it had sanjeevani in it but you see that mountain in front of you you see a whole bunch of other mount- mountains in front of you to me i have no qualms i have no fear or any fear of ridicule or whatever in saying when i did that i got to the mount my two friends were already there at the pass i got there i burst i i looked at the mountains in front of me i looked at the sheet of white in front of me and i cried you get that feeling occasionally um when you do think think that there's partly through tiredness but for me it was partly a realization of my sense of nothingness in this world so <laughs> i i was a speck of nothing uh you know in front of all this beauty and grandeur in front of me i i just it keeps my ego in check mm-hmm. uh, and it keeps my self of, of you know my sense of my own worth in check uh my friends who were there um they're still in melbourne and we do trek together so they completely understood what i was going through left me alone and i did my moment i had my moment and a couple of minutes later they just came and gave me a hug and said i know exactly what you you, you went through and it was basically a reaffirmation of uh you know my sense of place in where i am you know what what is it that that i do what is it that i'm doing the mountains teach me that every time the mountains teach me that Beautiful. now for a swimmer in an ocean they might feel the same thing a surfer right it's again a lonely sport you you're, you're battling the elements and your own sense of uh, capability to do what you're doing and you might get those moments as well but for me that particular moment and i said this is what i want to do at least once a year mm-hmm. to undertake that journey to allow the mountain to to bring me back to earth if you like uh, to use that metaphor but but essentially uh, to do that for me also it is a sense of purity it's a sense of me conquering my own fears my own inadequacies and trying to be better than um, mm-hmm. than what i was so uh, and it could be as i said for a person it could be surfing it could be swimming in the ocean so you get the same sort of feeling but to me the mountains teach me a very very important yeah, lesson yeah, like i love it yeah when you were saying that i mean that, thank you for sharing that that is so beautiful and i was thinking of uh, uh, you know some of the best dives that i've had and i feel very much the same way because in some sense you are lonelier because you yeah. have a bunch of friends around you you can't talk necessarily and uh, you are you know you uh, we we think that uh, uh, you know down there 
I, uh, there are so many creatures that just don't give a crap about <laughs> exactly. about you, about humans, uh, a, a, anything at all. And it's kind of profound to think that the things that we do up there, in some ways, impacts what's happening. Uh, what's happening down here? It's very humbling. It's a different universe altogether. You are, and to me, the thing that is humbling the most, Mohan, when I'm underwater, uh, is that you are very conscious. You are made very, very conscious that you are just a visitor on this planet. You are That's even it. more than ever before. You are a visitor in their world, and just the sheer amount of equipment that you need to go down with for school. But I mean, and these guys are just like swimming around, you know, without Absolutely. a care in the world. You think. So much adapting that we need to do uh, in order to just breathe down here. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just startlingly humble. I I haven't come across anyone who hasn't dived and hasn't had their you know worldview in some ways uh, altered significantly altered significantly yeah. altered. Right, and if you do not allow that environment yeah. to do that and have that impact on you, yeah, then then you really have to start questioning who you are. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. Because absolutely. It, yeah. To, so to me, that is very important. I mean, when you when I went on probably one of my best expeditions ever, which is to a place called Kalindi Pass, again, that was almost 6,100 meters. Ahead, and that was a tough trek. It was actually a tough expedition, not even a trek. And there, I saw one of the porters who came with us. And you know the kinds of treks that yeah, we do, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, yeah. we don't do as much of the hard work and the heavy lifting as some of the people that come with us. Absolutely. There was one of the porters there, no more than 15, 16 years old. And he was carrying a bunch of weight on his shoulders and walking from place to place. And to see him, uh, to the young lad, do this, it's, it's utterly humbling. It's, yeah. And if you don't allow that to affect you and reaffirm your own sense of purpose yeah. to keep the world or to leave the world in a much better place than, than you found it, yeah. uh, then the, you, we have to really start looking at ourselves and say, you know, what, what is it that we're doing here? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the mountains teach me that. Yeah, like one of the things that I've always noticed when, we, when I go on these weekend treks in, uh, you know, close to Bombay, these half day treks and all that, uh, is, you know, we take so much prep for it with our fancy shoes and our, you know, backpacks with water and all that, that uh, yep, yep. camelback and everything. And we have walking sticks and everything. We take so much prep for all this. And you have, a, you know, a regular lady to set up a Nimbupani stall up there, just yep. walking up casually with stuff on her head, uh, in chappals and sometimes barefoot as well, uh, mm-hmm. and just acing it. And you are so, and you're just reminded that, you know, uh, in a different world, uh, you know, if it weren't for the internet and all this knowledge economy and all that, we very much know who would uh, survive that. <laughs> I you bet. Know. You bet, you bet, you bet. And we've been on, we, you, you and I have been on some of these treks, these, yeah. these day treks around Bombay. But it's just a question of affirming our own interest and getting away from, you know, the things that we do to see the world around us and to make sure that, you know, we commit to leaving the world a better place than the one we found um, when, we, when we wandered in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, another part that I am not to, uh, so moving on from trekking, even though I know it's something that we could talk about mm-hmm. endlessly, uh, and I do hope uh, things ease up to a point where you and I can uh, uh, go up to the Himalayas, if not, or at least a, 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 a you know a mountain close to Bombay or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, touch wood, we will uh, touch uh, touch uh, touch rock, we will. Uh, aspect of yours which I don't know too much about actually is your involvement with arts and charity. Mm-hmm. Your LinkedIn profile tells me that you've been involved with the charity since 2005, and I know some of the things that you've done. For example, the the, the event that you had spoken about uh, a while back. Can you tell me what that's about and uh, what that's meant for you? Because you seem to be a kind of person who takes away a lot of life lessons and professional lessons from the other things that you do. So I'm kind of keen to see uh, for mountaineering, that's, that's, that I, I understand. I understand. But what, what has this sort of experience taught you? So, so to me, I've, I've been interested in, in predominantly music and, and music is a, is a big part of my life. I like the maths of music. Oh. Um, as much as I do uh, like music itself, I like, uh, which is why I'm, I'm more attracted to, to classical music uh, and particularly Carnatic South Indian classical music. Because there's, there's a lot of, if I don't analyze music, then I, I don't know what I'm doing. So if I, if I listen to music, I immediately start analyzing. It's probably not the best way to, to listen to music, but that's how I engage with, uh, with music. So music's always been a 
part of me, if you like. And I, I've never wanted to be a performer. I've never wanted to be. Even uh, though you sing very well, you must point. I, I, I sing. I sing. But um, yeah. for me, the engagement is an uh, is is analysis. The engagement is actually understanding. Wonderful. So I've always had music in my life. That's that's something that I can say. But for me, the extension of that is to is to provide a. Uh, 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 or create a space where I can use that interest along with my interest in charities. So therefore, form the company and promote it, lots of artists, and use the funds generated through gate sales to uh, support charities. So, so um, we ran an organization for you know four or five years, promoted some some really famous big, big names. And the one thing that I did realize again in, in the piece was you know you you have to really take big risks. In order to get big rewards, but calculated risks, you can you can do simple things like promote a, a small classical music concert that will get two hundred people through the door. You probably make you know uh, you know a few hundred dollars if you're lucky. If you're severely unlucky, you might lose about uh, five hundred dollars or thousand dollars through that. So I've done that. I've lost um, small amounts of money through classical music uh, performance presentations and so on. But the big uh, amounts of money that you can make. You give a charity $100, it really doesn't make an impact. It's a drop in the ocean. But in order to make those big leaps and big contributions, you have to pay, take significantly big risks. Of course, managed risks, but big risks. So we, uh, me and a, a friend of mine, we said, okay, we have to really be very careful about this, package some really big names, but take some managed risks and then present these big names. And then that'll enable us to make big contributions to people. So we had a, a goal. I, I'm a big, big, big believer in starting with the goal and then working out the details that will get us to that goal. Mm-hmm. So we said we'll raise one million dollars over ten over a ten year period. That's how we started in 2005. Started an organization called Charinda Charities for Indian Arts in Australia and promoted some big names. Um, in the very first one, we said, "Wow, this is this uh, this is a huge risk." We presented a big artist, made about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars out of that, and contributed almost all of it, to a charity in Calcutta. Um, and then the next one was a, was a bit of a failure. We did another one, which was a bit of a success. We did another one. So we did about five or six shows. I think in the end, we, we, don't, we, we haven't got $1 million. By then, I had to go, go away to India in 2010. So in that five-year period, we, we made about $560,000 or something like that, which is still yeah. quite significant. But the point is this, the big stretch goal enabled us to say, these are the various things that we need to do in order to get to even half the amount that we said we might do. You have to set your goals high and then work towards it with, uh, with, with an incredible amount of passion. And we did. We, we managed to, to generate a fair amount of money by promoting some big names, taking some big risks, yeah. but manage risks. And, and in the end, we were able to, to do a series of things and, um, you know, feel happy as well at the end of it. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. I, I read this essay by Neil Gaiman uh, recently, uh, which was, I forgot the title because it's part of an illustrated uh, uh, collection that I was reading. And you love this analogy, actually, which was, um, you know, when you're working, he said it meant it both from a professional, from a freelancer point of view. Uh, but I see the analogy over here and it links in with mountains as well. Just think of, you know, your professional career or your freelancing goal as sort of like a mountain that you're going towards. There will be a lot of distractions along the way. Um, but then take the choices that help you go towards the mountain, right? Just like when you're trekking, you take the path that takes you towards the mountain, even though there are possibly several other things to do along the way. Uh, or uh, diversions to go to along the way uh, as well. And that kind of, uh, you know, I think that uh, and the reason I say this is because you said something that was very beautiful over there, which was, you know, you start with a goal. So you know what you're aiming, going towards that helps make a lot of choices. And this is, I think, something people can use in their professional life or even, for example, in something as far removed from this as marketing, for example, where people, mm-hmm. where brands and companies do a whole lot of things because they are cool or they're trendy at that particular point of time or create a hashtag because everybody else is doing it. But at the end, it's always good to just take a step back and ask, oh, is, okay, we know what our goal is. We know what our business objectives or communications objectives are. Is this in service of that? Uh, Absolutely. Is great, uh, sort of there is one other thing about the goal and the way to, to reach it and the choices and the forks that you have in, and the choices that you make. For me, focus is as much about what you do not do yeah. yes. as it is about what you do do. Right. So the presence of a goal and the presence of a well thought out approach to it yeah. makes those decisions a bit simpler because mm-hmm. the focus on, on that and, yeah. and the drive that you get from it is simply about the choices you, that you make on what you do not do. 
and one of them could be just sitting in front of the TV for six hours. No, you don't do that. Yeah, you might want to do that maybe six months from now because that's part of relaxation. Yeah. But from the point of view of focus on that goal, it's what you do not do as much as what you do. In a sense, you're saying that it's also important to be very cognizant of what you are not doing. Uh, as much as it is a uh, complete awareness of what you're doing. All right, great. I would almost say it's, it's more important more than what important. you're not doing. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I think that's so much to uh, so much to take away from there. Now, uh, Mohan, I think you should like move towards the last part of what I want to talk about. And obviously, we have to talk about board games at this point of time. And I know this is what you've been <laughs> waiting for. So again, same question as with all the other things. Uh, how did this fascination uh, sort of start? Yeah, it's, it's open. I, I've been I've been very very fortunate uh, that uh, that I've had my influences come from a lot of people. I mean, I mean, I'm, it's not as if I suddenly discovered cycling and said, "Oh, I need to start cycling." You know, there's a, a friend of mine here in in Brisbane who said, "Look, this is this is how that conversation went." I, I said to him, uh, "His name is David," and I said, "Look, hey, I really am struggling with my running here. Brisbane is much more humid than um, than Melbourne, where I used to do a lot of my running." And he said, "Hey, you want to take up cycling?" And he me under his wing and you know we went cycling a couple of times and i loved it and and that's how that passion started my board game passion again started with a friend of mine in, in Chennai. He's a, he's a very very popular musician he's sanjay subramaniam um south indian classical Carnatic musician he introduced me to board games and and my god i, I fell in love with it it's just amazing it's it's a beautiful and then of course i read up on 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 board games and a whole bunch of other things it's an amazing way to, to spend time with uh, friends rather than just talking about Bollywood movies and songs and so on, which, which is also very nice. I'm not judging it. Or watching cricket, which is also very, very nice. I'm not judging that. But it's, it's a nice way to spend, to get friends together. And we used to do that a lot in Bombay, uh, Chuck, you and I, and, and a whole bunch of other people. Just a nice way to get people together, get them connected on something, actually doing something, building something, working on something either collaboratively or in competition. Um, it's a nice way to, to interact with people, to engage with people uh, on something um, and, and you know, doing something which is physical, which is a physical board game that you're working with. To me, so that's, that's uh, again, that was it's, uh, introduced to it by a friend and in love with it. And uh, as my wife says, and I can't take anything at a, at a surface level. I have to go really deep into everything that I do. And so suddenly I have uh, some 200, 250 board games in my, connect, in my collection and uh, use that to, to engage with people again. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's quite amazing. Yeah, I remember that entire cupboard of uh, uh, games <laughs> that you have, uh, that you've had. And uh, uh, I hope that the, the lockdown is, uh, as in like COVID has been kind to Australia, or rather Australia has tackled the uh, crisis Better than most, I'm hoping that you're able to start your uh, fa- your famed board game nights again. Yeah, miss those. We will, we will, we will, we will. But uh, I, I used to enjoy the, the board game nights that we used to have in uh, in, in Bombay, Hawaii, um, and similarly with other friends in in Melbourne or Brisbane. Uh, you know, that, that's a, as I said, it's a nice way to engage people. Oftentimes, the conversation is not about the game; it's about other things. And when you use that uh, artifact. Yeah. To engage, uh, it's just yeah. ultimately it's an artifact. Of course, you're in, you're collaborating on something, you're competing with each other on something. But ultimately, it's if you take take it too seriously, then of course you're going to be hell bent on beating the other the other person. Yeah. But if you, it, it also tells us to not treat, treat ourselves so seriously. It's just yeah. a game. Yeah, it's just a game. It's, yeah, quite interesting. All right, uh, more like the last part of this chat. Now it's already it's been a long, fascinating chat, and I'm sorry for keeping you for that long. <laughs> sorry, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, it's fun. Yeah, uh, last few questions are actually among the ones that I've been wanting to ask you the most, which don't pertain to a specific interest of yours. I mean, so many of them, and I'm sure that there are lots more that I haven't spoken about, but sure, uh, sure, sure. Uh, but maybe a part two of this can happen another time down the line. But, you know, I want to ask you something that's a little more fundamental, and that's honestly the, uh, you know, the way this whole thing started last mm-hmm. week. And, uh, you know, I out of the blue asked you a very random question, which, uh, which you know, we've never touched upon things like this before, uh, you know, which is on happiness and, uh, you know, life at large. So, you know, if I were to like, and this is how I read it externally. Uh, so you can tell me whether it's actually the truth or whether it's just good uh, PR on your mm-hmm. own. Uh, you, I mean, all serious and one, you seem to like lead a life right now, which many people might just say, and wow, I hope. I 
achieve something like that you know when i reach that stage uh, when wow. i and i don't say this from a wealth point of view i say this more like you you're happy you are you're passionate still passionate about what you do professionally uh, you have a happy domestic life you have so many interests and are good and like you said you get deep into them and and i can attest that you're genuinely fun to be around and you know in one word you're sorted you know it looks wow. from the, yeah you, you look like you're sorted so very broadly what advice would you have for somebody who's half or maybe even quarter of uh, your age in terms of just uh, you know living life happily i'm guessing also that there were a few things along the way that didn't work out as you would have liked them lots yeah um, lots lots many things don't work my 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 thing has always been failures have never mattered to me i've never been fearful of failure the only thing i'm hard on myself for is not trying yeah. so that's the only thing that i've been worried about that i might give up i might not try so having if i tried and then failed perfectly okay with me so i've never been fearful uh, of failure nor have i beaten beaten myself up on on failure i would beat myself up if i didn't try but that's, the, the, that's the one thing you're the fifth person i'm speaking to for this uh, for the series so far and i think almost everybody else has said exactly the same thing wow. uh, which yes. is it's not about failure but uh, i would beat myself up if it if i didn't try this. and i have spoken to people about this from a business context and from a personal projects point of view and in wow. your case i guess a mix of both as well yeah i think it's, it's a mix it's it's in every aspect of what i do so if i if i don't try to analyze the music i i'm dark on myself yeah but the moment i stop trying yeah uh, is when i know that you know thing i'm not happy yeah i'm happy if i try yeah. the other thing is happiness is a precursor to success that's for me yeah. i i define success by the happiness and and happiness for me is trying yeah. so these three are linked failure doesn't come into this or not succeeding doesn't come into it so trying and securing happiness or contentedness maybe um through that effort and that then becomes a precursor to success mm. now you might proceed on this basis either rationally or emotionally it doesn't really matter right there was a, there's this this is a lovely quote it says the heart rules the mind or the mind rules the heart but neither of them cares too much about the whereabouts of the feet yeah wow right? so this is quite profound so either the heart rules the mind or the mind rules the heart that tells you where to go but neither heart nor mind care about the whereabouts of the feet the feet just tell you what to do or or you know how to do it or whatever right so so this then defines what i do so for me in, in more more often than not the the mind rules the heart but there are occasions when the heart rules the mind but it's it's completely uh, okay for either of those uh, those things to happen i i i exercise a lot i sleep i like to sleep a lot um i i treasure experiences rather than possessions um for me material possessions have never mattered uh, although i just talked about 250 board games but <laughs> <laughs> but that that's never really been important so i i treasure experiences more than than possessions and i've been grateful rather than content so these are the recipes so working out you know doing lots of exercise i sleep reasonably well i treasure the experiences and the process of experience Uh, and i just basically commit to everything that i do I, and that uh, gives me the happiness that um, i think yeah and um, i project I, i if i project happiness that's good yeah yeah and just to like tie this up nicely with the first thing that is another thing that you that you do uh, that uh, you do very well is just uh, keeping a sense of humor about yourself as well so it's all these things and just don't take life and yourself too seriously and too seriously not at all work out i've often thought that that this is old that's a quote that we uh, that proverb that we've been taught in school right try 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 till you succeed uh, i always think that it should be try try till you become happy uh, that's because, it i think because try try i i you know i what what is was that in in uh, in the burns where they talk about the spider that that keeps trying 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 till the spider succeeds this is the one where the uh, that proverb burns wasn't it i i forget i'm not i'm not too much into poetry but i know what you're talking about yeah. i think it's a, it was was it the that is the story that inspired a general Uh, or a king that was hiding in a cave that that's the one that's right? exactly right that's exactly right yeah yeah but but try 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 um is is something that that uh, that I do but I, i'm i'm completely driven by the fact that i just have to try and, and if i don't try uh then then i stop to think about why i didn't do success or material success um is is completely relevant yeah fantastic and uh, 
when i started this i was thinking should i you know uh, should i sp- should i speak to uh, uh, you know should i speak to somebody who is as close a friend uh, as you for this thinking that you know we might just end up veering off into other directions but i am glad i tried that and what do you want because i think this is one of the most fascinating conversation i have mohan uh, that's pretty much about it even though we could possibly go off into several other directions as well uh, but uh, i think this is so much to unpack over here i'm i'm just going to uh, you know treasure this conversation uh, mohan thank you so much. much thank you so much for uh, your time uh, on this thank you for you know um, uh, you know everything that you do in the sense uh, whether it's consciously or unconsciously you have inspired so many people in your friend circle i'm sure you've inspired a lot of students who uh, uh, students in a completely different path as well and i think just um, i think you have an impact on whoever you end up meeting not to again thank you sentiment about it but i think and to me the most inspiring part of your uh, story in some sense is that you started this conversation by saying this is something anyone can do and that's exactly the point you know this is there's nothing extraordinary about you i mean i consider you an extraordinary person but what are you saying right now right if you, you were just a log that went along with the flow and took the right decisions along the way uh and i think that by itself is the most inspiring part in some sense that is not actually that difficult to do this just take the right choices lead life with a few simple principles and uh, yeah i think that by itself is uh, uh, that by itself is inspiring mohan thank you again so much for this and thank you thank you deepak thank you sir i i just want to uh, close to my point uh, my, my point is you're saying that for me the the discovery that to our friendship in 2000 and 11 was actually the other way around i was looking to learn a lot from from people like you and i did so it's 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 a uh, nice so uh, it's mutual yeah. it's mutual yeah yeah super uh, super guys thank you so much for thank you far and uh, all the like there are lots of notes that we will link that i'll put in the notes for this including the books that uh, i uh, the books the twitter threads the youtube channels uh, everything will be mentioned in the notes thank you so much for joining in uh and mohan where can people find you uh, explore your work if they want to um uh, on twitter is is good i'm not that active on twitter i mean as you you did refer I, to 2010 11 12 13 as the day days of twitter uh and since 2013 14 i've kind of slowed down on twitter but at mohan k on twitter yeah. is a good place to find me or they can send an email to m o h a n k a u s at gmail dot com fantastic and uh, you might actually uh, end up befriending mohan on strava Uh, these days where he is more active than on twitter mohan once again uh, thank you so much for being a part of if you stayed all the way to the end i am sure you found that as profound moving and just delightful as i did when i recorded this with mohan early on a sunday morning it absolutely made my day there are so many takeaways from that episode but for me the top 3 are uh, one just try things let happiness come from trying rather than from accomplishment be it a research paper or climbing a peak to don't define your own success or happiness by what it means for others this is something that i've been hearing from you know almost every guest that has come on to the show and third use humor even in serious settings but of course back it up with substance and self dep- and self deprecating humor uh, don't take life too seriously uh, we referenced many things in this episode all those links are in the show notes from books to youtube videos all of them are there please tell us what you thought about this i am at chuck underscore gopal on twitter mohan is at mohan k m o h a n k All other links are in the description of this episode and I hope to see you again next week for episode 4 of Getting Meta. See you then. Hi, I'm Zarina Punawala. host of the empowering series podcast on the IVM network i happen to be a peak performance coach and leadership coach by profession and i'm here to share with you productivity tools life altering techniques and real life hacks to help you achieve your maximum potential in everything you do your relationships professions careers so tune in every monday to unleash your inner power be safe be well be empowered We live in an age of disruption, of immense change in every aspect of work, life and business. 
but is the old way of doing things truly dead and are we ever going to stop saying the new normal join me varun dugirala on advertising is dead every tuesday as i talk to entrepreneurs leaders creators and change makers from across business media marketing and beyond to dig a little deeper into how we got here what we're doing now and where we headed you can catch all the episodes of advertising is dead on the ibm podcast website app or wherever you get your podcast from